Hello everyone. In our last video, we explained the basics of magnetic field coupling, and that serves the foundation for、um, RF current probe and near field probe. Right? That's how they work based on magnetic field coupling. So in today's session, we're going to explore further, and we are going to discuss the transfer impedance of an RF current probe. But before that, let's explain one thing first. Okay, so if you look at an RF current probe, because they're designed for RF current, radio frequency current, so the manufacturers when they build these probes, right, they calibrate it and they test it in a 50 ohm transmission line system. Okay, 50 ohm Transmission line system. So, in that sense, the current probe is often connected to a 50 ohm coaxial cable, and the other end of the coaxial cable can either be connected to a spectral analyzer, of which 50 ohm is the input impedance of a spectral analyzer. But many engineers would prefer a time domain analysis. In that case, they need to connect the RF current probe to an oscilloscope. So when you connect an RF current probe to an oscilloscope, one thing you need to consider is you have to choose the right impedance. Most of the modern oscilloscopes would have two options, right? So for example, in this case, you can select the input impedance between one mega ohm or fifty ohm. So one mega ohm input impedance is when you use the ten to one passive probes that often come together with the scope to measure your circuit. But when you are using an RF current probe or near field probe, it is essential to select the 50 ohm input impedance. Okay,、uh, for the reason we just explained. Another good reason of selecting 50 ohm rather than one mega ohm impedance for your RF current probe is that if we look at this probe, right, when you connect this to a 50 ohm、uh, input impedance, essentially. You're doing like this, right? So this is a 50 ohm resistor. You connect it to an RF current probe. Okay, so this is the equivalent circuit module, right, of the probe. And now think about it. You're gonna connect this to a wire on the test, right, by doing something like that, right? Now the question I often get asked is, would this now, if you look at it, this becomes like a ferrite core? Would this ferrite core attenuate the signal you are trying to measure? The answer is yes, but do we have to worry about it? Studies have shown when you connect an RF current probe, probe with a 50 ohm input impedance, the insertion loss that could, you could have on the signals you are trying to measure is pretty much negligible. Okay, and.、Uh, And for that reason, again, you would like to use the current probe with a 50 ohm input impedance. Okay, so that's the first topic. And now let's move to transfer impedance of an RF current probe. Okay, so this is a setup. We have a functional generator, which we have two outputs, and、uh, we link them together so、um, they are basically outputting the same signals. So we monitor the、uh, output of the Functional generator using channel one of the scope, and on channel two of the scope, we are connected to a、uh, uh, near field probe. Okay, and as you can see, as I mentioned, has to be 50 ohm、um, termination on both channels. Okay, so、um, on this end, we again we have a similar shape of a, a near field probe. Okay, and as we explained, when you do something like this, then expect there is mutual coupling. So whatever Uh, the uh, current going through this wire will then be、uh, through mutual coupling, and then you're going to generate a voltage on this near field probe. So let's have a quick look. So if I output, right? So this is the、uh, pulse waveform we sent, right? And you can see this has a five volts peak、uh, square wave voltage. Okay, and then look at the、uh, signal we pick up if we get these two close. Okay. So here you can see we start to see pulses,、uh, but it's a different shape, right? Picked up by channel two, and you can see that in channel two, the peak-to-peak -peak measurement is about 300 millivolts. 300 millivolts at the moment, yeah, 300 millivolts, right? So that's the level we are 
picking up by this. Okay, so now let's try another. Now we bring the uh, TPCP2500. Okay, so this uh, probe has a transfer impedance of roughly 16 dB ohm. Okay, 16 dB ohm. So, so that's, uh, you can do the math and that, I guess that translates to 6 ohms or something like that. Okay, um, anyway, so for this test, let's just see the difference. Okay, so same again, but then I do this trick, right? Remember, okay, so now let's see the difference between an RF current probe and a near field probe. Okay, so I set it up like that, and you can already see the current uh, I picked up is already. Uh, Big, so I'm reducing it. Okay, right. Okay, so yeah, this is um, the waveform we monitored when we were using an RF current probe, right? Uh, and you can see the difference. The shape is different, and the peak-to-peak -peak voltage measured here is 2.2 volts. Okay, remember these numbers: 2.2 volts. I guess now you have a question. So we've seen different waveforms picked up by the small near-field loop and also the RF current probe. The waveforms are different. So which waveform do we trust? Or in other words, what are we really measuring by using these two methods? You can see now we've swapped the input. Okay, so this is your typical um, current probe, let's call it, right? This is a uh, mix 6 CP103 with a bandwidth of up to 100 megahertz. So it can capture rise time pretty uh, accurately, right? And uh, it works down to the DC level. Obviously, it has lots of uh, active components here, right? Rather than passive components. So um, we're going to have a look at the current waveform because this you know really measures the current right so we're going to measure the current going through the uh, small loop here right and really see what is the current waveform by using this method so let's just test it okay so now i clamped it okay right similarly to what we did with the rf current pro okay now i'm output and output okay again you got channel one, which tells you the voltage waveform. So yeah, still five volts peak, right, with one megahertz um, frequency. But look, the current waveform is rather following the voltage waveform, and this is really what expect, isn't it? Because you are supplying a voltage across a essentially a conductor, so your current should be similar waveform. In this case, square wave. Um, but I would like to point out, right, so if we disable channel 1 now, and I put uh, channel 2 here, you can see that uh, because it's 100 milliamps per division, so in terms of the waveform amplitude, it's about 200 milliamps. However, however, you do see an overshoot and ringing, right, you do see an overshoot and ringing, so if I just do that, you can see that, right? You may wonder why, why do we see an uh, overshoot and ringing here? Right. Is it really the current waveform going through this wire loop, or it could be a measurement error? Okay. To answer that question, let's first have a look at what causes this overshoot. Okay. So in our um, pulse generator, we can. So if I go to waveform, my right, currently square wave, I can change into pulse wave. Right. Similarly, one megahertz and output. Right. Similarly, uh, you see the same waveform. But with pulse waveform, what we can do, right, is you go to um, the uh, parameter, and you can select duty ratio, offset, amplitude, and more. So if we go to more, and then you can see currently we have a rising edge and falling edge of 5 nanoseconds, right? So pretty fast rising um, time, okay? Now if we change into 10 nanoseconds, what's, what's going to happen then? Look, the overshoot and ringing has been significantly reduced. Uh, so this actually gives us a good indication. This, this means, right, the rise, uh, the overshoot and ringing you saw on the waveform when we have 5 nanoseconds, right? It's perhaps due to uh, what we call electric field coupling. Because what happens is you've got a high dV over dt, and then you have some small parasitic capacitance. And therefore, you get coupled current 
uh, from um, the uh, the small loop to the measurement equipment. Okay, so yeah, um, so in my opinion, this waveform is caused by the electric field coupling between the device on the test and the um, the probe. Okay, so how do we prove that? How do we prove that? Right. Okay. So just quickly disconnect the current probe. Okay. So this is the current probe. Right. So I I actually went to the manufacturer's data sheet. It didn't give me the capacitors of this current probe. So we cannot prove it. But in the simulation model we're going to show you later, it doesn't take too much capacitance to couple that high energy pulses into the, uh, the probe. Therefore, you pick up all the uh, ringing and overshoot, which actually is not the current going through this wire. But what we can do is, right, so now I'm going to disconnect this probe, okay, and I'm going to bring a um, another probe, right, right, another current probe. This current probe is a different uh, uh, model, okay, so TPCP230K400, okay, and we're going to show you the results of this current probe, okay. So because, as I said, the benefit of this kind of RF current probe is that it has really, really good electric field shielding capability, okay. So first again, uh, and also Notice that in the previous case, I select one mega ohm impedance because that's um, how it works with the uh, uh, Mixic probe. Where this one we said it has to be 50 ohm. Okay, so I put in there 50 ohm, and then I do that. I'm gonna close it. You see, the waveform now becomes more like a uh, square wave, and also you don't see any uh, uh, ringing and overshoot. So now it's the time to demystify this right the three different waveforms which waveform do we trust okay use rule of thumb give an estimation between 0.5 perhaps 0.7 depends on how 